homelessness and helplessness. The government gives them the drugs, builds bigger prisons, passes a three-strike law, and then wants us to sing God Bless America. No, no, no. Not God Bless America. God damn America. That's in the Bible for killing innocent people. God damn America for treating us citizens as less than human. God damn America. As long as she tries to act like she is God and she is supreme. Oh, t- uh, take it away, Alex. <laughs> this is an Alex app. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome back to Pod Damn America, the goth pod socialist podcast for the stupid children. It's a science episode today. Uh, hello, I'm your I'm your host, Alex Patek. I'm here with my merry band of men, Jake Flores. Uh, yeah, yo ho ho. I'm sea shanty pilled now. And that. Anders Lee. Anders Lee, the science guy here. Ooh, an exciting new direction for you. Yeah, this science is a uh, rules. <laughs> science rules. That's right. This is gonna. This is like a kind of like a speculative one. We're about oh, to I have do. a robot voice pedal. Science. Wait, no, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't come that across. <laughs> didn't work. That was a good theme song. Science. Damn it, it's not working. Oh, science rules. <laughs> that is pretty good. <laughs> I didn't know if you were just setting up an impression you've been working on. <laughs> Although, as I learned, Bill Nye, uh, like our guest, is actually not, he's a polymath. He's not really a scientist. He's a. He's a, not a science guy. But he, 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 he's, but it's, it's very um, true on the numbers that he is a science guy. That doesn't mean you're a scientist. Uh, sure. In the science and into the world and into all sorts of things, economics, the novel, etc., uh, without being officially a, you know, certified uh, doctor in it. Wait, if you like so Breaking a, Bad, I, you're a science guy. He's the sci- he's a science guy the way, like, Velveeta cheese is a cheese product. It's not <laughs> well, really, it's not... He's skirting the definition. I don't know. I think he's he is a he is a quintessential science guy, which is just is someone who's enthusiastic about science and loves it. But that doesn't make him a trained uh, scientist necessarily. You could be a science guy without being a scientist, is what I'm saying. Well, he's I'm definitely saying, a guy. We don't know that actually. I probably shouldn't gender him at this point. I I just said Bill we Nye. Him. Yeah. <laughs> He was on TV screaming it to the world. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the 90s, though. You know, things That's have true. changed. Bill Nye's was, question. Bill Nye, in many ways, was kind of the uh, the Bill David Nye Bowie of the 90s. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, uh, this is this is an important segue because we have on a different science guy t- today. Yes, uh, we have. He's also a science guy. He's also you may have heard of this next guest. He's a science guy. Uh, we have Kim Stanley Robinson from books. How many of y'all like books? Which fan? Not <laughs> typically of. I like books so much that uh, I've actually read um, all three volumes of Remembrance of Things Past by Proust. Yeah, uh, dude. Which is. It- um, in the in the world of this interview, that's what something I have done. In reality, it's actually <laughs> not true, and it's my girlfriend's uh, book. Oh my it. god! You'll that's see so- in the interview, uh, our our the science guy who we're interviewing points. He he's able to recognize from Zoom and like I'm six feet away from them he, the volume of the three books uh, that uh, make up Remembrance of Things Past by Proust. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that's actually my girlfriend's. Book. And the compliments you got from it were like, yeah, wow, this I... shows you're a tender soul. Someone who really <laughs> understands humanity. And you were just like, yes, that's right. I'm basking. The lion guy. That's what you are. No. Just for... I, no it's not a lie if I don't. If he had said, did you read it? Mm-hmm. Then I would have. Did you that. really read it, Anders? Uh, 
I have uh, I've not read it. I've heard people talk about it though. So Lion Anders Lee at it again. I'm one of the world of lies. I want to be one of these people who just reads the literary criticism without reading the actual book, and then get sure mouth off mouth off about it at coffee shops and whatnot. Wow, how joyless! That's (laughs) fucked up. New guy just dropped. Uh, before we swing into the show, I just for the sake of podcasting it, maybe let's explain exactly who Kim Stanley Robinson is for anyone unfamiliar. He's not a science guy necessarily. He's a science fiction guy. I mean, he's a science guy, but yeah, science true. fiction author who is a leftist um, from the, the original batch. Like, if we're talking in Gremlins terms here, we're the second movie. Um, and he his books are utopian and about the world running better with little globules of gas going through tubes everywhere and making things work better. <laughs> if you like trains, you'll like his his books always have like very efficient boats and stuff in it. Yeah. So I feel like that's, that's got to be enough for half of you <laughs> fucking monsters. <laughs> <laughs> that was my for the uninitiated asterisk. Right. It good. was good. I appreciate it. Oh, fuck, well I forgot to ask him about Oz. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be our hook to get him back yeah. for the the long long wizard of oz discussion i i forgot i was gonna ask a really annoying question about the baby yoda show i just wanted to know what he <laughs> thought of it whether it was like cool or not he has thoughts on everything it's he's a great guest um but it's it's tough because you have to pick and choose what you ask him you, you have can, to pick and choose did i did i fan out too much is that cool? Did no, I play you cool? Were, no, you were cool. too quiet. I was like, Alex, this is your this is your moment. You get to interview your hero. We're on Zoom. I don't want to cut you guys off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel bad. For the, I, I, I hogged up Kim. Stan. You, you hogged all the Kim, but you know what? We all got a good a good handful of the science guy. And yes. I think you're all gonna enjoy the interview. It's really really special stuff. We are here with the notorious Kim Stanley Robinson of space. Stan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Alex. Good to be with you. Very exciting to have you here. I've read a bunch of your books. You've written several amazing books about the end of capitalism and the future of humanity. And uh, today I want to focus our conversation on your most recent one, Ministry for the Future, because it's a very good book. It's a book about solving climate change. And people don't talk enough about climate change. So I decided to do all the talking for them here on my goth radio program. Mm -hmm. Uh, I got some questions for you. And uh, just just to ease us in, they're ranked from easiest to hardest. And uh, I just want to see what you think about politics and climate because you're a you're a smart cookie. Does that sound good to you? That sounds good. And I appreciate easy to hard. Um, I'll get warmed up as we go on. Yeah, this is the stretching phase. Good. (laughs) We're going to ease in. Okay, question one. In Ministry for the Future, I, I just uh, plowed through it this week. I noticed one of the lead scientists behind the glacier pumping project, project is named Peter Griffin, and he falls in a ravine and dies. Yeah. Is this a specific reference to f- the Family Guy character? <laughs> no, I have no idea... Um, I, I don't know anything about Family Guy. Is there a Pete Griffin there? I threw yes, him it's. Of- have you seen The Simpsons? I have seen The Simpsons. They basically yeah. took The Simpsons and uh, whitewashed them. They made them white. Uh, the Simpsons <laughs> and <laughs> wow, Peter Griffin is basically a ripoff of Homer Simpson. Uh, wow. So it's in many ways sort of the stereotype of the ugly American, someone who uh lives by their whims and just um is very impulsive and uh consumes a lot. Uh, uh also I might add about Peter Griffin is that the, the show Family Guy is sort of the uh all, like the deep impact to the Armageddon of the Simpsons in that it is equally very popular. So for something to be in the cultural imagination that uh you know that out there or whatever at that degree it's very funny I guess for us you know, for us millennials to be reading <laughs> and then wow. the characters named Peter Griffin. Well, I love uh, the Simpsons and I don't know anything about family guy, but which I, I, I mean, that's one of many ways to date me, but I think Homer and the rest of the, the Simpson clan, uh, they really stood for something. They're a classic American family. 
And yep. uh, Homer, Homer's a great character. I love him dearly. If Like, I would not have named a character Homer Simpson and then just killed him off by accident. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite glaciologist friends is named Pete, and he will recognize this little tribute. Um, and uh, I was, I'm thinking back to what I think Griffin is just a coincidence or an accident i needed a name and there's a lot of names but the the truth is that when i was last in antarctica and i mean to say i've been there twice and i loved it it was thrilling and uh easy travel to other planets uh, just to i want to go back if i can scam a way to do so um but the last time i was down there was as a roving reporter i was in McMur mcmurdo which is the american base down there uh and in the Summer times is a little town, like a weird uh, Alaska mining town of a couple thousand people almost. Um, in Antarctica? In, in Antarctica, yeah, on Ross Island. Yeah, they they fly into it. They they put an icebreaker into it once a year um, to drop in a bunch of supplies. And they coordinate all the scientists, and they have a big uh, helo port and, and use even old Vietnam helicopters, which is very scary, to helicopter you all around. Um, and get you out into the countryside to do your science. It's, I love McMurdo, and they and the people who live and work there, they love it too. Uh, and it's only open six or eight months a year, so they've got a very peculiar existence. So the last time I was down there, one of the old ice heads who had spent his entire scientific career down there, a glaciologist, I believe, he took a shortcut in his snowmobile, um, which he shouldn't have done, and uh, and dropped into a crevasse and was killed. And so. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody was shocked, and it seemed to me to be something to put into ministry for the future, just to show that um, even if you try to imagine a good world happening, shit is still going to um, bite you, and death is still going to happen. So uh, the it was very deliberate to re keep reminding people in this novel, oh my gosh, we're we're solving climate change, you know, happy, happy, but Stan, such an optimist, you know, which is code for what an idiot. <laughs> um, opti optimist in our culture. Nice. I can relate. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, it happens. So, but what I wanted to do was keep poking people, um, needles in the eyeball, the occasional slap to the face, um, to remind people that um, even if you're trying to imagine a positive future, dark stuff is going to happen, and that would add to, I was hoping, the the sense of realism to the good stuff. So mm -hmm. that um, when you're reading this book, you're getting thrown around from good feelings to bad feelings. Right before this Pete Griffin character drives into a crevasse, they had just discovered very something very hopeful and cool. So this was the kind of uh, whiplash experience I wanted ministry to be. You know what I always wondered about, and obviously this death was um, accidental, but uh, and I think this could be more relevant at, in the future as. Uh, the Earth gets warmer in Antarctica. Uh, what is the law there? So if, if somebody is uh, commits a murder or something, how is that sorted out? And do you think that's going to become more and more of an issue um, as, you know, possibly it's mined for resources or whatever? Well, it's a good question because it um, it, it leads to these uh, peculiar thoughts about utopia and Antarctica being a scientific utopia. And there is no sheriff. So, um, like, for a long time, they had one one pistol in McMurdo, and they kept the parts of it in different locked cabinets. Wow. So that nobody could go nuts and use that gun to shoot a whole bunch of people and then shoot themselves. Because there's a lot of psychic stress down there, especially, you know, the winter, it's dark for six months straight. It's right. You can't be positive that someone won't go nuts. So they kept the gun in different places locked up. And it was just like the nuclear codes or something. Three people had to decide it was worthwhile to get a gun out in order to be the sheriff. And then they would call in the U.S. Navy. And the U.S. Navy could get there within about 24 hours from uh, New Zealand. Okay. But other than that, it is just a place where people understand, like some Wild West place where there is no law where the sheriff is weak and you you know that if you did something bad you'd get kicked off the ice and when eventually and most people desperately want to stay on the ice so there's a certain enforcement of norms so uh, anders it does sound like a good place to flee if you have committed a crime <laughs> in america yeah, yeah. It's, it, have you ever seen um john carpenter's the thing i just rewatched that and it just recurred to me that's like 
Movie. It's very similar. It seems to be a movie that is expressing an anxiety about that. Yeah. I, I mean, what I don't get it. The thing is one of the three or four great classics of, uh, I don't know, monstrousness or not, not horror, but uh, thrillers set in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. And um, it doesn't really make sense, but whatever. It, maybe the isolation. Maybe, okay, you've got a few people. It's almost like a space station functionally it's it is a space station you're out there and you die if you're outdoors and and so on and so forth so the fear factor if something goes wrong is ratcheted up that might be why they do it but yeah i love all uh i love all antarctic stories and and uh, i collect them there's one where a tidal wave hits mcmurdo or a volcanic explosion on mount erebus and it i i mean you know gz Bad thrillers are one of my uh, favorite genres. So if they combine that with Antarctica, then I'm totally sold. Yeah, I'm a big fan. It's a spooky place in a way. Maybe you don't feel that way if you live there, but the isolation part of it, that's, you know, that's right up our alley. Um, And in a way, we're trapped with a thing, a thing called the Earth's changing climate. Yeah. (laughs) which we'll be discussing today. Um, This is the next question I have on the easy docket. I've read six of your science fiction books. Where's the damn aliens? (laughs) Well, um, Stanislaw Lem, Solaris. It's been made into a movie twice. Um, And the book uh, was, I guess it was published in Polish, maybe 19... 60 or so and got into French first and somebody translated the French into English and German, Russian, finally proper English translation. It hit when I was about, I was into science fiction and suddenly there was Solaris is like, I'm trying to remember, call it 1971. Uh, and so That's I was the six hour movie, right? Well, I think one of them is Tarkovsky. Okay. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's six, but it feels like it because it's nothing happens too long, in um, my opinion. It, it, the Tarkovsky is famous uh, for being uh, mysteriously whatever. You're either uh, interested or appalled, depending on whether the it. I think if you see it on the big screen and you're in the right mental frame of mind, properly stoned or whatnot, it's um, uh, mesmerizing and beautiful and, and mysterious and interesting. And you can fall asleep for a while and wake back up and you haven't missed anything. But the, <laughs> but I'm saying this, the book uh, finishes off the whole idea of the alien. That ocean is probably an alien intelligence. And Lem's point is that if we did run into really run into aliens, they would be so alien that they wouldn't be talking to you through a translation box five minutes later. They wouldn't be in the same dimensional set, maybe it, 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 whatever he, wh- every possible question and answer and interesting story that you can tell about encountering the alien, uh, Lem did them all in one little book. And so ever since then, I've thought, well, I don't have any alien ideas. And I think that's partly why I do have a joke story where uh, two alien races meet on a planet for their ritual war and a human a uh, settler on the planet is uh, has the only translation box by which to translate between these two alien species, and he tries to mistranslate to each side. It was kind of a Cold War fantasia. Uh, so I have that one alien short story. I think it's called The Translator. I don't know. It's a long time ago. And then my novel, Galileo's Dream, when Galileo gets time-traveled to the year 3000 or whatever it is on the moons of Jupiter, Um, the future humans with their time travel machine have taken them into the future to decide for them as being the first scientists whether they ought to make an incursion into the ocean of Europa because there seems to be an alien inside Europa. And later on, it seems like the parent of that alien inside Europa is perhaps the planet Jupiter itself as a sentient um, alien creature. So, 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 you know, I don't, I'm a very, I'm mostly a really realist writer. And so the story for Galileo's dream involving time travel, I thought that's already magic and impossible. And I'm filled with paradoxes. I can't, you can't unclaw your way out of the paradoxes of a time travel story. You're doomed. It, once you get into time travel, then the, the name of the story is paradox that you can't get out of that. Every one of the time travel stories ever written, if they're paying attention to it, that's the only story there is. 
So I thought, well, why not throw in the aliens, the time travel, everything that I'm not very good at and can't quite get, wrap my head around. I'll put them all in the same novel, Galileo's Dream. And I have to say, I really love this novel. It's it's one of the least known of my novels, even though I wrote it in, it was published in, say, 2010. But um, the combination of historical novel and um, far future Fantasia novel, well, people, um, I don't know, if people are usually like one or the other, but not both, whatever, I don't care. I like it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna, I got to check that out. I, I, I do appreciate how seriously you take the writing, because if you go back to early science fiction, like you go to like Isaac Asimov or something, people would make up aliens. They'd be like, yeah, they're aliens. They have four arms and they only speak slightly off Spanish. Yes. <laughs> they're like you or I and they their their money is chips or whatever. And that's like a book. And you just have to believe that for 300 pages. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. I, and all I can say is, as a patriot of science fiction, that they were doing something there that was like a game where the realism of it, of real aliens, was not on the table, but it was more of a metaphor or symbol. And so every alien is standing for the other. And so we're on a planet. We're stuck inside our heads. Even your twin brother would be a radical other that you don't fully understand we're just trapped in ourselves and so everybody else is another with a big o incomprehensible to you and uh a deep mystery so early science fiction they, they put it into a bug-eyed monster that's green and has four arms but oh my god they know how to love and uh, etc so it's pretty transparent the symbolic games going on and i would say that does not um uh, disqualify them from saying something interesting and telling a good story. There are a lot of great stories. In fact, one of them, what's it called? It's by a guy named Stanley Weinbaum. He died young. It's called maybe a Martian, some simple title, a Martian Odyssey. Uh, and it's about running into a Martian. And it's really one of the most beautiful stories, even though you can't believe in that Martian one little bit. Right. So, yeah. Your style, uh, yeah, strikes me as very different. It's, I appreciate the the plausibility. As you know, I'm a fan of DC comics, and one of the things I like about DC as opposed to Marvel is I actually try to make everything make sense, even though it kind of can't. But uh, like they do the Crisis on Infinite Earths thing to make all their differing realities sort of um, symbiotic. Uh, and it strikes me that you're more of that style than someone like Philip K. Dick, who's also doing a lot of social commentary. Uh, I was, I'm curious if he w has been an influence of yours as well. Well, he sure has. I, um, I, I did my PhD dissertation on Philip K. Dick. That wasn't my decision. My advisor, uh, Frederick Jameson, uh, oh, wow. rec that, was he, that was my advisor. He recommended that I uh, study Philip K. Dick for a PhD because he said there's lots to say. There's lots to unpack there. It'll be easy to write a dissertation. And he right now is the greatest living American writer. Because at that point, uh, uh, Phil Dick was still alive. Um, he died about six months before I finished my dissertation. And I, I would have sent it to him, although he would have just laughed at it probably. But he probably would have been pleased because he had a a, a kind of gut-wrenching, tough, paraliterary, uh, pop-lit career where he was getting paid uh, $1,500 for these novels and and writing sometimes like five novels a year. Uh, just spinning like a rat in a wheel to try to make enough money to get by. And he was a great novelist, but r because of these conditions uh, of, of um, professional existence for him, um, really slipshod, a lot of times uh, taking amphetamines and writing a novel in two weeks. I mean, there's going to be holes in that novel, but it's filled with great ideas. And Man in the High Castle is beautifully written. There's You can pick about five or ten Philip Dick novels that are um, solidly written and truly mind-boggling and he's very funny so um i love him and he's a california writer and he's very much of an anti-capitalist so and formally in terms of how to construct a novel so that you have these characters that are uh, seem uh, kind of three-dimensional and real and out, outside of the control of the novelist he is really good at that despite his obvious obsessions so yeah i love him a not although f hilariously and i gotta continue this because 
Anders, uh, for your audience, I can explain that we're talking on Zoom just to make it more fun for us. And right behind Anders' left ear is my other um, graduate work specialty, Marcel Proust's Remembrance of Things Past in a beautiful box set. Wow. Um, You've been set- eating your carrots. Oh, uh, well, no. that not that far. That box set, especially when you're the main person on the screen, is unmistakable. Uh, uh, and I, I definitely know my Marcel Proust, whom I also love. And indeed, when you would finish one volume of Marcel Proust, which is like eating pound cake or something, <laughs> and it was it was seven volumes originally, not the three that you have behind your ear. Although I have that too. But in any case, I'd finish one volume of Proust, and it was just like, oh God! And I'd read three or four Philip K. Dicks just to enjoy life uh, or Jack Vance. (laughs) And then I'd go back diving into Proust who he is a great novelist. So these were two great novelists and they couldn't be more different, but it shows you how the novel has got this fantastic variety of possibilities. So you can take amphetamines and write one in two weeks and (laughs) it can be a great novel, or you can put yourself in a cork lime room and spend the last 25 years of your life doing nothing but writing about your first 25 years. And that too can be a great novel. And, you know, I just love the, um, the variety and the power of the novel as a form. Yeah. You can do anything. I want to talk about something that I've heard you mention, which is that the novel, uh, being that they're generally about these interpersonal relationships between people, it's kind of a bourgeois form. And what you're doing with science fiction is a little bit counter to that, and that it's this like huge world building thing. I've been thinking about that a little bit because I've been reading like Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is not science fiction, but it is like a hundred years long, you know, every book or whatever. It's a it's a bird's eye view picture of the thing or whatever. Um, do you find the form of writing even like science fiction novels limiting to what you want to talk about or is is you know is that specific genre really where you're able to express anti-capitalism and you you know these utopian ideas and stuff like that have you ever tried to write anything else you ever thought about well, a video game <laughs> no no video games i don't um, i don't i'm not fast enough uh, i watch my sons play them and they're more your age and so that's one of those things do. where i try to play the games i can understand what we're even trying to do um, basically skiing downhill or uh <laughs> or uh maybe portal but um but but in terms of novels Wait, sorry, I, <laughs> I i but i, I may, yeah Sorry, I think I might have gone out of. I don't. I didn't ask about a video. I didn't mean to bother you with a video game question. <laughs> <laughs> I must have flipped out or something. I don't know. I kind no, of derailed it. I'm sorry. Don't worry about video games. <laughs> okay, no, but I, I, I'm, I'm gonna talk to all three of you. It's like a juggling act, and it's fine by me. But to go back to oh, it was now, uh, science fiction has been um, uh, a. A, a huge gift, and I define myself as a science fiction writer. But it has some limitations, but those, um, but the opportunities it gives you are bigger than the limitations. And like the bourgeois novel, and well, Proust's novel is probably uh, a maybe the greatest novel ever written, but also definitely a high point in the bourgeois novel uh, about domestic life, about the interiority of a single uh, sub. sub subject per you know what is that person thinking what's it like to be a middle class person in the world and so it's you your immediate uh, friends and uh, loved ones and enemies and then your society and how things might change well um that's a model that's one form for the novel and there is a crowd of people that thinks that's the only serious form for the novel and those people i quite hate <laughs> um, uh, for their limitations. And I, I love Garcia Marquez because he blew them up with uh, 100 Years of Solitude, the idea that a novel needed to be about the uh, interior life, dramatized scenes, show, don't tell, um, detailed explorations of stream of conscious and all that. And then suddenly 100 Years of Solitude, it was translated in English around 1968 or 1970, same time as Solaris, and it was like a bomb going off in people's ideas of what the novel could be. Nothing was the same after 100 Years of Solitude. And and that novel doesn't have a single dramatized scene in it. It's all told, not shown. There's no dialogue. There's There's famous lines that one remembers years later, but it's not part of a dialogue. And yet it's one of the greatest novels ever written. In fact, it sits right next to Proust, in my estimation, as 
Uh, he's certainly in, in the top handful of, of novels of all time. And you had to rethink everything at that point. And it was very useful for science fiction writers to say, hey, if Garcia Marquez is right, then we don't have to spend um, 50 pages inside the pondering of a guy who's going from his bed to his window to look down on the street, which is a great scene in Proust. But it's not the only way to go at it. Right. So um, uh, what I've tried to do as a as a person who loves novels and loves literature in general, and much more so than the visual world. I don't know movies. I don't know video games. I don't know anything. Um, I only really know print media, I guess you'd call it. Uh, or really, literature is a better way to express it for me. Well, um, those, you can almost triangulate. Proust, Garcia Marquez, Philip K. Dick, Stan, well, Quadrify, uh, Stanislaw Lem, who is, you know, like an AI writing a book. Well, they're all great. And that's what I love about what I do is that I pick and choose. I'm an English major. I've got these ideas. They're weird ideas. They're usually science fiction. And I, and I go with that. Like, what's the future of this idea going to be like? And then I can pick and choose the mode, the the form, the method. I mean, that's why you get Ministry for the Future. That's It's not that that's unprecedented, because you've got weird novel forms like Ministry for the Future in the tradition back there. But I felt free and I felt knowledgeable enough to go ahead and cobble together the weirdness that is Ministry for the Future. Right. So, yeah, it's an advantage to know the tradition if you're going to write. Uh, if you're going to write a novel, the more you know about novels, the more tools you have at hand. So I always feel that's my one and only. Um, I have that going for me. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And on the, the bourgeois point, I th I believe um, Balzac would be considered a, a bourgeois writer. But Marx really liked Balzac because it was a bird's eye view of yeah. cities. And I haven't read a ton of it, but it's, you know sort of a macro understanding of different characters intersecting with each other's lives and sort of getting into the political economy of, of a city and a, a community. Um, yeah. Wire gets compared to Balzac a lot for that reason. Yeah, it does. Babylon Berlin, I would say too, is a really great sort of another television example of, of that form. Yeah. Balzac is important too, because of this, um, all of his books uh, coordinate into one larger super novel. And it's like what you said, he goes from, he, he gives you the complete uh, political power structure of Paris and France in his time from the very top to the very bottom. And with a big weighting on the, the kind of um, super mobile bourgeoisie of his era. And Marx liked him. Jameson likes him. Almost anybody likes him because he's pre-modernist. He's not spending a whole lot of time worrying about the moods and the affect states and the thoughts of a single subject. Yeah. So that's where what modernism is. And as much as I love hugely uh, Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, uh, Faulkner, that whole tradition of high modernism, what happened after the World War II, university English departments in America latched onto that as the only way to be good. Mm. That was the high point. Everything else was bad. Suddenly, Balzac wasn't as good because he wasn't as interiorized. He was more about social life. And of course, science fiction couldn't be good. Well, you have to go back to Balzac and you have to go outside this tradition of high modernist interiority. Um, as to what makes for a good novel. And in other words, those high modernist novels are very great, but they aren't the only way to be great. So yeah. that's that's what you got to keep in mind. Yeah, that reminds me of something I heard as uh, when I was a teenager, I studied acting and one of the teachers was talking about po the post-war theater in America. And every play was our apartment in our problems. That was That was it. That was the extent of Art and that was the best vessel they thought for understanding the human condition it was just a, a bourgeois relationship. Just yes. to add another point to this, that also reminds me of something uh, I was thinking about. Just Frank Zappa kind of famously said, "Like, why does every song have to be about like falling in love? You know, every mm -hmm. fucking song is, oh, baby, I love you. What about yeah. a song about an Eskimo drinking a piss snowball? You know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Got to watch TV's out like for that, that yellow movie. snow." Yeah. <laughs> I didn't exactly. know that was about an Eskimo. Wow. Okay. We always sing that song when we're snow camping. You got to watch out for that yellow snow. And, <laughs> it's a song um, that teaches a lesson. 
<laughs> There's a great Zappa song that's at the end of my novel, Aurora, and I was very sad, the uh, audiobook uh, reader of that novel, and she was fabulously good. She didn't know the Zappa song, so when she gets to uh, Let Me Take You to the Beach, na 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 and this is all a Zappa hilarity, well, she had to make up some different tune, and it was just, I was very sad she didn't uh, write me. To ask for what tune the kid should be singing at the end of Aurora. <laughs> um, I want to get back to your work here for a second. So um, you've been you've been writing books about the end of capitalism for a while, at least in the Mars trilogy, and then in this book. Now I'm sure you've written a lot of books I haven't written, so I'm just blaming the dark here. Probably happens again, right? Yeah. Um, and the the way it ends does vary from story to story. And and the Mars trilogy came out in the '90s. I was wondering if anything has changed in your politics since you started writing. Well, um, not very much. I am a, a hippie kid from the Vietnam era. I was radicalized at UCSD, UC San Diego in the early 70s by my draft number, by mm. Frederick Jameson, by my fellow students, by my cohort. It was a generational thing. And especially if you're on a college campus that had Herbert Marcuse and Angela Davis and Frederick Jameson all teaching you uh, political science. Um, well, that was quite an education. And then I later ran into Gary Snyder, um, Buddhist hippie, California poet, um, and um, the science fiction writers that I learned from included Ursula Le Guin. And in other words, there's a left tradition that was booming in the 1970s, although it was very clear as the 70s went on that something wasn't working, things were curdling, going wrong, uh, looking worse. And then suddenly Reagan got elected and it was like walking into a door that was slamming in your face and nobody expected it. Everybody thought there was a door where uh, everybody thought there was a door there that we were squeaking through that would lead to some kind of new world. And then, boom, the door slammed in our face and we were stuck with the 80s. Well, my politics didn't really change. And I, I, I guess what I would say is I've tried to become more flexible, less doctrinaire, less uh, uh, obscure interested in purity and more interested in getting things done. This is very common for aging leftists. You know, you, you, um, when you're young, you want to uh, completely change the world, have a revolution, start over from scratch, blah, blah, blah. By the time you're old, you hope that the zoning codes will be greener and, you know, that you can, um, get a proper pension, et cetera. It's, it's, um, it's a natural, uh, relaxing or ham getting hammered into, um, more moderate positions or, or even just a desire to get things done that will actually last through the generation through into the future. So that, you know, I think my generation actually uh, accomplished an awful lot and then famously did not accomplish an awful lot. And certainly capitalism roared back in the 1980s. So then it's kind of like at that point, you're, you're, you're playing defense rather than offense. And you have to think hard about, well, what would work now to turn the tide, to uh, hold on to what's good and to make more good. And so I have I guess what I'd say is I've tried to continue to educate myself into all of the possible ways to encourage left successes. And, and by left, I just mean uh, people over uh, profit, um, government over business, um, uh, environmentalist, uh, you know, the. Uh, more more justice, more sustainability in the biosphere term. And so that's why I just say leftism rather than anything more specific. Just uh, that's a kind of an orientation of history um, that I want to uh, push everything leftward. And I'm left handed. So I kind of like the, <laughs> the weirdness of that. Uh, you know, it's very convenient for me. It's a very natural thing. More left. Well, that's what's so interesting about this book, right, is uh that what you said about, you know, when you get older, you look for more uh, concrete changes over than a total like smash and redo the whole thing solution, you know, young radicals gravitate to. But climate change is the most radical situation the world has ever faced, you know, at least in terms of human civilization. Uh, uh -huh. And so people do gravitate towards those things. And the reason this book stuck out to me so much is you 
go against that wholesale and then have a hundred small fixes that do deliver the product at the end. Um, I have some of them written down here and I guess this is like minor spoilers for the book, but it, the book's oh, not really about what happens yeah. as Spoil. much as how, you know, Spoil away. I'm yeah. going to spoil it. And that does make me a bad person and I'll live with that. But uh, you let's see what you got in the book. Okay. You have international glacier pumping efforts. They paint the sea yellow. They spray mm-hmm. chemicals in the sky. The end of war due to untraceable universal drone warfare. That's like a pretty small part of the book for such a big thing. Half of Trevor the earth is returned to the animals. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Really, just listening to this and being pissed off at the spoilers because they were like, what was going to happen with the animals? Yeah. <laughs> just throwing their book away. Uh, <laughs> Uh, happy Earth re- so they can maintain the ecology and so uh, I'm reading it but in spite of all these massive like international projects that you can't it, it's hard to imagine any of these happening right now I, I know tons of people my age who would just take a paycheck just planting trees if that was a thing you could do That'd and awesome. the infrastructure isn't there um, yeah. but the, yeah. the biggest selling point in your book and this is what I want to talk about uh, I think comes across as the carbon coin which yeah. is Good. Flipping capitalism on its head. It's making money by getting rid of carbon instead of burning it. Yeah. Uh, so you essentially use capitalism to make communism. And yeah. I don't know anything about finance. Is that a thing that could happen? <laughs> um, well, yes. Uh, that's the short answer. And I must say, um, I didn't know anything about finance. And I was reading some criticism of my Mars novels. And this was 20 or 25 years ago when the Mars novels first came out. And it was going to be so, so, such an interesting novel, big honking 2000 page novel. Too bad Robinson doesn't know much. Obviously, he doesn't know much about economics. And that pissed me off. And then I thought <laughs> to myself, you know, I'm an English major, and the truth is, I don't know much about economics, and so I was winging it in the Mars trilogy. And I, have, luckily, I was relying on good sources. But I have spent the last twenty years reading um, economics and political economy, which isn't exactly the same thing. Uh, a little bit bigger and more philosophical and more political than economics proper. I, I mean, I had to learn that economics means analysis of capitalism. Political economy means alternative economic systems that have to be proposed speculatively. And that obviously what I do as a science fiction writer is more political economy than economics. And thank God for that. But right now, getting back to the carbon coin, and I'm glad all the things you listed, this is really what the novel's about. And it's very true that the carbon coin is at the crux of it, that um, the central banks of the world create money. And the more you think about money, the creepier it gets. It's a system of social trust. We, if we all trust in money, then my numbers in my bank account make me able to walk down to the store and walk out of the store with um, a, a whole bunch of goods that will keep me alive and help my house and all that and feed me and, and, and so on and so forth. Some numbers change somewhere. Um, but all I did was slip a plastic card into a slot and I walk out of the store with, let's put it, $300 worth of cool stuff. That just happened yesterday. Well, Nice. Why should why should that work? Why does that work? Because everybody believes in it, like a consensual hallucination, hallucination, like a Philip K. Dick scenario, in which everybody on this little asteroid, since they all believe that if you knock twice on the door before you go in, that you won't get zapped by a ray, um, they all knock twice on the door before they go inside. Um, that's money, and so. Um, there is a, a, a lot, there's a lot of people who are thinking that if you lose trust in money, you get Germany 1927, where you've got wheelbarrows full of a trillion mark bills uh, made of paper in order to buy a pig that it will uh, feed you for a week. And then they tell you, no, you need four wheelbarrowfuls of trillion mark bills for, uh, for me to give you my pig. In other words, Radical inflation, which is happening in some countries on Earth right now, radical deflation, where your money's worth nothing. Um, it it was so scary that at the end of World War II, there were many governments that said, never again, central banks have to be um, semi-autonomous from a legislature, so you don't have a populist leader coming around and messing with money. Um, they're, they're, and they, are, they have one main chore, keep the... Uh, inflation or deflation from happening, keep interest rates steady, use interest rates to keep the value of money completely steady. That's our one and only chore, and we have more or less steady money. Well, now, okay, I say this because into that scenario, 
if the big central banks, and I'm talking US, China, the European Union, Japan, a few others, if they all were to say, we're making up $5 trillion a year that we are going to inject into the economy, but we don't just give them to the stupid private banks that hoard them and speculate and gamble and, and behave like the 1% behaves. We give them to people who have sequestered carbon and we give them uh, and the governments involved that will be dispersing this money instead of just giving it to the private banks. Like in 2008, you give them to carbon decarbonizing products projects you if you save 100 uh, tons of carbon then you're given a carbon coin and it trades for whatever on the currency exchange markets like any other uh, currency and it might even compete with the us dollar of being the currency of last resort the one that tr people trust the most it could happen if all the big central banks did it so that's what i have happen in my novel and that's what, like turns the crank for all the other good projects that you mentioned they can get paid for in a way that it's not quite capitalist because it, it's it, except for the you could describe it as Keynesian capitalism uh, in a way, although it's even a little more targeted than Keynes. And that's why you've got modern monetary theory, uh, which is this group of radical economists or political economy thinkers that are uh, saying there should be. Um, uh, quantitative easing that's directed. So that in this case, carbon quantitative easing, and then also full employment. This is really important to the MMT people that the governments be the employer of last resort and anybody on earth, like you just mentioned, Alex, I want it. I mean, I, it'd be good work to get paid a living wage that you could live on adequate, adequately for planting forests. And that would be sequestering carbon. If the government guaranteed a job like that, and and it would have to be a variety of jobs, not just reforestation, because there's not enough land to, to occupy everybody, but there is enough work to occupy everybody. Well, you you kind of turn a switch on capitalism. You get to not communism, but you might get to what you would call, I don't know, the names are weird: social democracy, democratic socialism. Um, full it's it's full employment. Uh, with the government as the employer of last resort is such a game changer that we don't have a good name for it. Um, it's not exactly communism. These these 19th century slash 20th century terminologies, they're not adequate to come to grips with the climate change, um, with the modern world financialized, but also climate changeized. The solution is going to be a, a weird new amalgam that when you use older words, and I say this as a happy member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Oh, yay. Um, God bless the DSA. But um, because I've been wishing for that my whole life and now it's here and I'm really happy. But, um, you know, when um, what you want to do is use the right discursive tools to convince as many people and in this case, as many Americans as you can to get on board with you for, to create a working majority. We might even see Joe Biden hire a brain trust that will be way more radical than Joe Biden has ever been up to this point in his life. So far, signs are promising compared to what I thought they would be. He's getting good reviews. These sort of things, his appointments are way further to the left than you might have guessed. So, um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I'm getting lost in the weeds here, but um, the carbon quantitative easing is something that we need to describe in American terms. So maybe it should just be called public utility districts, that, that the public utility district is a crucial thing. And that whenever people really need something, when it's a necessity, like food or electricity, that these should be public utility districts and not um, items for profit where people suffer if they can't afford it. Well, well, I know Anders has a question on MMT for you here in a second, but I guess the, the one thing I, I want to know is, so in the book, you have the Ministry for the Future, which is created by the UN in response to a disaster, and then they push, they push the, the wheels turning on this. They get the carbon coin going. What real-life agency is going to do that? Because I don't see any kind of international cooperation on that, on that level. You know, well, I, just to interject, yeah. you know, what I was thinking yeah. about the entire time you're describing the uh, problems with private banks and the, the dots to get to how to make the carbon coin thing happen. We talked about this a long time on our show, a long time ago on our show with our friend Josh Androsky, but a uh, public banking might be some something that could fill uh, the gap in the middle there to just to to eliminate the problem of of yeah the, the the bank acting like a gambler and an investor or something like that. Just throwing it out there, though. I obviously don't have the answers to how to solve the climate problem here on our show today. 
Well, uh, yeah, but maybe we do, at least in theory, um, because uh, public banking, What uh, another good term like public utility districts is simply credit unions. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the people who have put in the money into a bank are also, it becomes like a co-op where you own that bank yeah. also, then private banks, instead of uh, their profits going to shareholders who are other rich bankers and the whole 1% problem, it gets spread out in co-op fashion. So that you um, you can see um, you could you could see the conceptualization of that. And but to go back to what Ali said, the mechanism internationally is the Paris Agreement, because the Paris and this is why uh, my Ministry for the Future is a function of the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement already exists. It's an international treaty. All the nations signed it. The UN set it up through the IPCC, which is another one of their um, uh, organizations. So it's a derivative. Um, way down the line of the UN. But what I want to say about the Paris Agreement is that if I had invented it in a science fiction story, everybody would laugh at me and say, Stan Robinson, utopian science fiction writer, what an optimist, uh, slash what an idiot, you know, never going to happen. And there's the Paris Agreement signed in 2015 by every nation on earth. And it has a little clause in it. It's very interesting to read the, the 18 articles of the Paris Agreement. A couple clauses say we have the uh, ability, if we want, to set up a standing committee that doesn't just meet every year, but is always in activity, and uh, we can set it up for whatever we want mm -hmm. so that it would be through the Paris Agreement that all the central banks would would perhaps get pressured by national state, nation state governments. And I have to admit your main point, that we're in a nation state system well, we have a global problem. So in a way, we're semi-screwed and we have to invent workarounds really fast. Right. Well, I'm very curious about, about MMT. We could, you know, I'm tempted to totally take that off on a tangent because I, I honestly don't know what to, to make of it. I feel sort of an obligation to try and have an opinion, a stronger opinion than I <laughs> do already. But there's interesting points being made on both sides. Uh, I, you know, people like Doug, Doug Henwood, uh, have critiqued it from the left. And uh, one of the things I'm a little sympathetic to is the point that, um, y yes, there are left-wing MMTers, there's Marxist MMTers, but there's kind of a strain that is uh, more liberal and they're very opposed to the idea of taxation. I mean, I think they, they want to do it if there's inflation and they need to stave off that. But other, But otherwise, they are against... For instance, saying that, you know, we need to cut defense spending. We need to raise taxes on the rich to, to pay for that. Um, you know, I've, I've seen this come from a couple of MMTers saying like, we don't actually need to do that stuff. It's money is, is fictitious. So we can just make more money. Um, I am curious though about, uh, Biden too, because you mentioned, you know, he, there are signs that he, uh, you know, people joke about him being the most progressive president since Roosevelt. I think that's possible because what's the bar? You know, I guess LBJ. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But but one of the things that I think is kind of the best case scenario is uh, him stopping the deficit hawker that he was, you know, a big uh, champion of in the 90s and for most of his career and embracing uh, Keynesianism more uh, deficit spending, uh, maybe MMT to some degree. But without actually going at the power structure in, that, um, you know, in our economy, the, the ownership structure, the raising taxes, seizing wealth, that kind of thing, just sort of is there a danger that, that we just create kind of this equilibrium with, um, you know, larger social spending. But at the same time, corporate America capitalists are allowed to continue going rampant and, and also, you know, uh, grow because, um, I mean, I know you, you would address this in the book, but isn't one of the big problems the, you know, the, the corporate power and actually taking over and seizing those corporations and, and bringing them, uh, into public control? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I agree with all that you're saying. I mean, and what's, what I mean by that is I understand what you're saying and the, and these concerns I've heard and have had to think about them also because I think they're real. Um, uh, it seems to me MMT is kind of just a Keynesianism adapted for our time. And and where they differ from Keynes is Keynes has said, when you've got an economic crunch and a depression, government spends more money. Mm -hmm. And then when when the economy is going well, 
government needs to raise taxes and suck that money back in so that government ultimately needs to keep a rough balance between outgo and income so that everybody doesn't understand that money is just a complete fiction and you still think that there's like a set amount of money that you therefore trust. And what what MMT words will point out is that in actual fact, since World War II, when there have been boom times, we haven't tended to suck money back into government anyway, and yet we still haven't gotten rampant badness. Now, on but now let's follow what you were talking about, because I'm very interested in it. Taxes are good for hammering the rich and for hammering mm. corporations, independent of bringing money into government, which maybe government can just keep making it up from scratch, like like pure MMT, but um, taxes are nevertheless good because a good progressive tax would simply horizontalize power. And so a, a, a really honking strong progressive tax that is on um, personal wealth, assets, corporate assets, corporate income, and also carbon burn, really sharply progressive so that the more that you're doing the more the more money that you're making the bigger that your company is the more assets that you hold the more of that you're giving over to the government not to fuel their coffers but just to disable yourself and to equalize the rest of the of the power gradient of society at large i love that stuff it's basically piketty thomas piketty was very mm-hmm. important on this stuff and i like his i like his recommendations and what i'm finding in my mind is um what if you and you know cuz economics is a kludge it's an improvisation the whole system is uh, like they do something very often they can't tell if it's going to create inflation or deflation they argue right. about that that's how messed up they are theoretically it's not physics so uh, since it is a kludge why not try all the things that sound good without trying to build a theory that would accommodate it all as if it were a machine so this is a philip k dick idea um a story is not a house it, if if you have a staircase that shoots out of the side into space and stops there out in space, in a story, you can do that because you're writing a story. In a house, you wouldn't want to do that. It would be unsafe. So um, an economic system, a political economy, you're trying to accommodate all these various forces. If, if a tool seems good and it seems somehow delinked from another tool, so what? So... I love the idea of taxing the hell out of um, like there shouldn't even be billionaires and then they're not a problem. So, and, and Eisenhower, you can always quote Eisenhower and he and a Republican Congress passed a progressive tax rate that where you, when you made more than $400,000 a year, you paid 91% of your personal income in taxes. Um, It's about as, as stiff a progressive tax as has ever been instituted. And it was by Eisenhower and Republicans. Now, why did they do that? Well, it's a little mystifying. I, I don't have a quick answer for it. But I think World War II made the whole world completely distrustful of rich people as being war profiteers. You didn't have glorification of the rich the way they have it now. It was more like, oh, those bastards, they started the war, we all died, they stayed rich, and now we're going to hammer them a little, even Republicans, even Eisenhower. So um, we're at a moment where I think especially uh, people your age can be saying, look, we're getting screwed. The gig economy is a name for being screwed. Capitalism has come to the, the, the late stage of neoliberalism where I'm in the precariat because everybody's in the precariat. I got no guarantee of, of health care when I'm sick or of a pension when I'm old. And um, it, it couldn't be worse. So what have I got to lose? And so at that point, you don't go breaking into the capital and taking selfies of yourself in costumes. You're actually... <laughs> organize in a way to change the laws and make them more leftist. And so the New Deal and the Green New Deal, these are great, viable new options for young people to get behind. And on the international scale, you got the uh, the Paris Agreement. All right. So this plays directly into uh, one of the hard questions I was going to ask you, because we are rounding out here and I got to get around to one of these. I have a hundred. I didn't get to, I got to get to this one. Um, well, let's go new- a little longer, but you got to edit down. We'll, I don't absolutely have to hard stop it. Uh, uh, so go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know if you're going to have a lot to say for this one too. So we'll get around to this. So we talked about the new deal, the green new deal. These are the, uh, the, the state levers of power moving to address the issues at hand. Right. Um, 
And uh, so when you were interviewed by uh, our sister podcast, The Antifada in 2019, it's a great interview. Check it out. Um, You said you try not to write about violence um, because everyone else writes about sex and violence and you think it's kind of boring. And I respect that as a writer. And uh, many of your books showcase these bloodless revolutions where capitalism is destroyed by way of overwhelming political and cultural calls to change. And, you know, people having meetings and, and coming together. And you've been a Marxist for the last 50 years. After seeing the domination of the neoliberal turn since the 80s, how can you believe in social democratic revolution still? Like, when are the levers of power supposed to start kicking in? Well, I don't know. This, you did ask a hard one there. Um, um, I'm thinking about the uh, so-called colored revolutions in Eastern Europe at the end of the uh, Cold War, uh, 1989 through 95 or so. I'm thinking about South Africa. There were elements of violence, and especially in South Africa. But by and large, uh, so many citizens said, we're not going to do this anymore that the government could no longer dominate the state when it was a bad state um, had to shift. And sometimes the revolution got very violent at the end in terms of decapitation of the state heads, like in Romania, you know, you grab the president and his wife, you shoot him on Christmas Eve, and then you've got a new government. And, and yet the more violent the revolution, the more screwed up the succeeding power state, I'm thinking Zimbabwe, South Africa, uh, Romania, Um, uh, the more peaceful the revolution and the more orderly the transfer of power, the more you have, there's a really important book by uh, an Erica Chenoweth called Why Civil Resistance Succeeds. Um, uh, Mass numbers of people demanding a change, and sometimes just through voting in a change when democracy unexpectedly becomes real. Um, I'm thinking that there's two things that uh, strike me. Maybe you it's a more realistic option and you don't get things like the Capitol on January 6th. Maybe it's more more likely to get a good result coming out of it. And for sure, by advocating nonviolent resistance, you stick to the nonviolent side of the ledger and you're not advocating violence that you yourself would never do or want done to you. So you don't have that basic hypocrisy. Um, which I have to say in the 70s was very prevalent on, on college campuses. Um, so, um, so that's why I do that. And it's more, it, 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 the neoliberal turn was a, such a shocker. And the 80s were like shock. The 90s were, well, maybe things are getting better, but we didn't really grasp how much the American Democratic Party had been uh, shifted rightward because it wasn't clear until it was mostly a done deal. And then ever since 9-11 and George W. Bush, one of the true low points in American history, like maybe lower than Trump in in terms of real world damage, um, it's been a rear guard action. But more and more young people have had their lives balked and screwed up. And uh, momentum is building maybe for a shift back to the left. And there's now people doing theory, and I'm interested in it, saying, can you get the benefits of a revolution without the violence of a revolution by some kind of Aikido, legal, uh, civil unrest, uh, nonviolent resistance, general strike, if everybody didn't pay their mortgage and their student debt payments and their... um, their odious debt bills on the same 4th of July, the whole financial system collapses. And then after that, you have a majority of AOCs in Congress. And, and, uh, you know, you see what I'm suggesting that there is, um, there's always, uh, that one should always hope for, uh, a peaceful transition to a more just and sustainable world. And since it's probably true that the 1% and big power will never give up on power, um, voluntarily just from the goodness of their hearts or the rationality of their calculations, um, you might have to press a lot. So I don't know what that means. We're, we're all in an experiment. We're running together. I think it works in the book. Um, and, and it is certainly the way that I would like to see a revolution. You know, I don't want to have like, I don't want to have to fight a cop to yeah. the death in the streets. I'll probably <laughs> lose. Um, yeah. So I guess there's only two there's two things that keep bringing me back to this. And one is a real world example. And then the other one is uh, something you said in the book. And the real world example 
is uh, the elections we just had in the West. And I know if this is an international project, you know, this is a specific example, but we just had Bernie Sanders running on these uh, social democratic reforms on a national level. And in the UK, you had Jeremy Corbyn. And these are two both extremely inoffensive gentlemen. You know, I know they're they're demonized, played up in the media, but these are like nice old men and people yeah. hate them. And I don't think that's anything they did so much as the corporate and private powers flexing their muscles and turning public will in their agenda. How do you contest with that? Because I feel like that's the voice missing in this book sometimes is like the scary opposition. Well, uh, I must say in the book, I have the children of Kali breaking into their homes at night and killing them. And so there's a terrorist response to people that bad uh, who are deliberately flaunting chain, uh, the idea of change and, and um, basically like vampires living off of it. You put the stake through their heart. Um, it's symbolic action. And actually that part of my book scares me completely, but let's go to Bernie. Cause that's what we all know best. I find the situation in the, in the great Britain or the UK mysterious and hard to understand. I read the London review of books. It's the best review out there on earth today. And I only get more confused about England, but in America, I've watched it and uh, Bernie won. Bernie won by, uh, by losing, by sticking to his principles. He dragged the whole, a window of acceptable discourse way to the left. And so even though he got attacked individually and they were able to um, balk him from getting the actual running, it's his, it, it could even be said, I think somewhat accurately, that it's his program that Biden is, Biden is attempting to enact now. And and let's contrast him with a, a, a person who I've gotten uh, quite fond of because he liked my book, uh, Barack Obama, you could say that he lost by winning, and not that he isn't a good guy and a smart guy and, and obviously a great reader of science fiction, um, <laughs> but, um, but the thing is he was, un, he was inexperienced. Uh, he, he became president when he was quite young, and he had only been a senator for two years, and all of his experiences as a community organizer in Chicago and his estate senator in Illinois – gave him the false impression that um, ordinary Americans were reasonable people and that they would accept him and that compromises could be made. And he became president, tried to compromise, and he didn't realize uh, that uh, the MMT possibilities. He played it a, a super conservative game to get us out of 2008. So that was a, you know, never, never uh, let a crisis go to waste. That crisis kind of went to waste, 2008. Yeah. But then Bernie said, wait, this sucks. You know, the, the uh, Democratic Party has just become um, um, uh, Repub lightweight Republicans, Republicans light. Uh, and the working people of America have no one to turn to. You could imagine a lot of uh, working people who turned to Trump were turning to Bernie because they needed representation in Washington. And, and, uh, and he stuck to his guns. He was consistent and intelligent. And he, every time you're watching Bernie, you know, he's conducting himself. He's a he's a weird old guy from Vermont or, where, or New Hampshire, wherever he's from. But he's compelling. He's intelligent. He makes sense. And he has a, a program that, you know, isn't corrupted by any other forces. And and he pulled the whole Democratic Party leftward such that Joe Biden, who has a checkered past um, that we don't need to worry about anymore because he was beholden then. And now he's in a Democratic Party where the base of the Democratic Party, young base, is Bernie inflected. And, um, and, and Biden is flexible enough, and he's got all that experience to say, well, hell, why shouldn't I just turn into FDR here? I'm old. Um, uh, I, I got nothing to lose or what, nothing to win. I've had an incredible life. I'm going to go out on an FDR high. It could happen. So Bernie won. Bernie, I I hope what you just said is true more than anything in the <laughs> world. <laughs> uh, and I guess uh, the, the one other issue that I wanted to talk about, which is from your book, is uh, you have the head of the minister of, from the future, uh, Mary Murphy, and she's a proud Irish citizen. And she talks a lot about the lessons she's learned from the violent resistance and the troubles in Ireland. And uh, you, you have a, a little dialogue on the end there in one of the last two chapters about what you can learn from China and the century of humiliation and their rise as a global superpower and, uh, you know, what we can learn from them. And I love bringing up this topic, not just because it's the one people get the most mad at us about, and I would like them to get mad at you about now, but um, 
<laughs> wasn't that rise through violence? Like what, <laughs> what can we learn from them that wasn't winning a civil war? Yeah. Well, tough question. Uh, but let's say this is my teacher, Fred Jameson, always historicize. Um, so you, what you do is you look at history and realize it's never going to be like that again, but there are some lessons to be learned. So if, Mao, power comes out of the end of the gun. You're in a, a, a situation of complete um, uh, social breakdown, civil war, war warlordism, um, a, a desperately poor peasant class that was, if you treat them right and become the people's army, then they become on your side, they support you, and a kind of vanguard army can go out there and fight in a full-on civil war. Well, okay, but wait a second. We're in the United States of America. It's 2021. And one of the things that I think is beginning to become obvious is that um, rule of law holds is a very strong and um, powerful force that a lot of people uh, take for granted. And that when you resort to violence, you immediately start losing support from that same general populace. So for Mao, when his people went out there, his avant-garde people went out there and started killing Japanese occupiers, the populace said, oh, yes, we love you because they're starving. Um, ordinary middle-class Americans, as precarious as they are, as unhappy as they are about the fate of their kids and climate change and their own lack of health care and all that, well, they're not in that same situation of desperation. And when violence occurs, they're thinking, that's likely to turn out bad. And the side that is uh, exerting the violence, who are they going to exert it against? If you exert it against the state, the, especially in the United States, I'm not talking about China, but the United States, you've got this tradition, this myth of uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people with democracy so that you elect your representatives, they represent you, they pass laws in your favor, and everything is copacetic. Well, where is that breaking down is that our representatives go to Washington, D.C., and they're actually beholden to big money, to corporations, to the 1%. So even though you elected them, if they can trick you enough, then they can actually vote for laws that hammer you. So that's one of the things Bernie did, said, look, let's put representatives in into the, the positions of power that will pass laws that actually help the people that, that elected them. Well, the powers that be hated that message, and of course he got hammered in terms of the discourse of battle. So where's the battle going on that in America can work? It's the discourse of battle, the battle of ideas and words. And so I think, you know, one thing you could do is is on July 4th, um, especially if there was a Republican administration, let's put it this way, if on July 4th, 2025, and some awful thing has happened, um, if every student didn't pay their student debt and every householder didn't pay their rent or their mortgage on the same July 4th, Boom, the whole thing crashes. So there's your revolution without having to get killed for it. And because it's a financial structure we're trying to change here. Yes, if we don't pay our student debt the one time, uh, which <laughs> I do it all the other time, though, to be clear. <laughs> well, it would have to be organized. It would have yeah. to be a strike, a general strike. You know, I we're getting close to the end, I know, but I wanted to point out a little bit back there that right now in India, the biggest democracy on earth, there is a general strike going on that is poorly reported in the American press. We're such fools and not paying attention to the rest of the world. This general strike in India is gigantic. Modi might fall, and he's in terrible trouble because the ordinary people of India, between his racist government and not paying attention to COVID properly, in other words, the same problems as Trump, and Trump went down, so Modi scared shitless because the people of India have gone out into the streets and said, we're not going to take this anymore. We're not even going to work. And so as India begins to fall apart, Modi's power begins to fall apart. Of course, his people will get violent, just like Trump's people's got violent. And in many countries, it's so scarily more violent than it is in the United States of America that for us to be freaking out over vandalism at the Capitol, when you remember what's going on in Yemen, Venezuela, um, sometimes Colombia, uh, Somalia, Sudan. I mean, this world is filled with uh, failed states, and the United States isn't even close to a failed state. So we're kind of freaking out because we're in a soap opera here and everybody's very melodramatic. 
um, when you get down to the fundamentals, like uh, investors like to do in in Wall Street, uh, and that whole uh, image of financialization. When you get down to the fundamentals of the way things work here, um, we're holding pretty well. We've had a great transition that is inflecting leftward. The more we watch the Biden Brain Trust, and also in India, uh, it's it's showing that a general strike can can shake a right wing power really effectively. So there's no reason to make a choice. I guess the one thing to end on is you all at your age, you don't have to make a choice between violent revolt. We got to become the weather underground and we're going to spend 40 years of our lives in prison if we don't actually get killed for it or complicity and um, being part of the gig economy and being screwed the whole rest of your life. That either or is not the either or. That's a, that's a, a, uh, a kind of a cartoon cliche that is a sort of a doomism. There are uh, lots of powerful strategies in between um, that that are available to you that range from the discursive battle and, and just changing minds one by one and getting a working majority in legislators to a full-on general strike that is uh, nonviolent but powerful. So the tools are there. And I think things are going to happen. I mean, you guys are so much younger than me that when I think about when I think about when you're my age, you're going to be in a completely different world. Uh, it's going to run differently because this world is unsustainable. So when you think about that, it's both, uh, I mean, it should be a little terrifying, but it also mm-hmm. should be um, kind of exciting. I mean, it's a project. You're involved in a historical project. Right. What? You know, it's well, easy to forget, but it is exciting. <laughs> I, I love to think about the future. You know, I might even write a book about it. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good tool. It's a good tool. Imagine it, and then you make it happen. <laughs> yeah, um, I heard you recently uh, say talking about capitalism and uh, how you made an interesting point that it wasn't planned. It it happened. It was a series of reactions, uh, and the, the system changed over time. And I think we're going to get a new system sooner or later. Uh, and there's the ingredients are here. Uh, there's good ingredients and bad ingredients. And I think the what we have to do now is is focus on the good ones and build them as much as we can, and you know try to think through through things without totally uh, being determinist and um, yeah use collective action. And I think that's um, I think really the key. And whatever whatever tactic you're using, it, it, it has to be done uh, collectively because our power is is in numbers, and that's in numbers. You know, our potential yeah. power is in numbers. It's, you know we don't even have the numbers we have yet, but. That's how we're going to get whatever we get is is through uh, cooperative action. Yeah, yeah. I we're all good materialists here. We all understand that it's you know through you know our power being in numbers and strikes and things like that. But I I also I guess something I've been thinking about since I've been sort of looking into your work and uh, reading about you is the, the utopianism. Uh, I think it's it's pretty good because you're pinpointing that a lot of the fight here is ideological. And there is this great cynicism that they sort that the powers that be, the big corporations and, you know, the big corporate interests that are sort of fighting against us at all times use uh, to sort of maneuver away from us being able to sort of negotiate for any change. So like something I'm drawing a big parallel here, forgive me, but something I've been thinking about a lot is the you know, the, the shot that we might have had at like some sort of weird police abolition or reform or whatever this summer. And a lot of the way that people explained away that that couldn't happen and that we need these police to be riding around in futuristic Gundams and shit with machine guns is, um, there's this, this Hobbes quote that, uh, like life is naturally nasty, brutish and short or human nature is, um, and I don't think that's true. I'm a annoying person who does not think that's true and thinks that, you know, we could live without a police state and all the crazy things. And I noticed that that is something kind of inherent to writing utopian science fiction is that uh, you don't fall into the pitfalls that people fall into where they go. No, everything is terrible all the time because they use that fear to stop us from organizing any of this stuff and go, don't, don't, don't go for burning. You know, that's crazy. Better things can happen. Um, So I just, I, I admire that as a part of the fight is idealistic, you know, good ideas. Yeah. Uh, One of the things that uh, uh, occurs to me when you said that, 
is that um, somebody has been describing my ministry for the future not as a utopian novel, but as an anti-dystopian novel. And that struck me very strongly, that you've got to be opposed to dystopia because that leads to defeatism. And that you were talking about, if you give up in advance because people are always rotten, then good things won't happen because you don't believe in their possibility in the first place. And there's the ideological battle. So you got to be anti-dystopian. You got to be anti-anti-utopian, uh, and anti-dystopian is a better way to say it. Um, and then for me uh, to um, try to wrap it all up, I, I like to be encouraging to everyone on the left. And many people will say, "Well, you're just barely left of uh, you know a Bill and him, Hillary Clinton. You can get attacked." No matter what you say, you get attacked for being not the, not the right kind of leftist. Yep. I like to put it out on a time horizon, a science fiction story that goes out hundreds of years in the future and go out to the far end of it and say, there's going to be a, a post-capitalist system out there. Let's not name it yet. But then in the near future, like what do we uh, advocate for right, no right now? It's really a version of Keynesianism. You go anti-austerity in the, immediately, like start helping people. Then Keynesianism as a way to pay for that. Then maybe MMT. Then um, social democracies like Finland and Norway. Uh, social democracy is a function, a version of capitalism with a big social safety net and, and a heavy progressive taxes. Then maybe democratic socialism as the next step where you acknowledge that everything that people really need should be a public utility district. And so the basics of social socialism, that the means of production, and, but, and I'm, I think a better phrase than that is the necessities of life are a commons that everybody has a right to and doesn't have to pay for or get exploited for. Uh, and that would include their own labor. And at that point, when you get past democratic socialism, then you could call it communism, but that's a, kind of an old 19th century and scary term for Americans. So I just call it post-capitalism. I call it X. And, or even, let's not forget anarchism. You get out there far enough and there's a total horizontalization of power. Everybody on the planet has an equal amount of political power and an equal amount of wealth. This is what I take it anarchism is all about. Um, and I've, I've written introductions to anarchist uh, collections, and I and a lot of people interpret my Mars books as being pro-anarchist, which I amazes me, but I'm pleased too. What I'm saying is that wherever you are on the left, you can place them on a timeline forward through the centuries and say, my my favorite will be in charge in 400 years. Your favorite is maybe a necessary step that's 200 years out. Don't start fighting over that stepwise ladder to a better political order. The narcissism of small differences, it's called. Yeah. Where people who are real close to each other and understand each other, they kill each other in arguments because they understand each other. Mm -hmm. And then there's the right just laughing at us and kicking our ass. Right. So uh, I would say solidarity with everybody on the left. Yeah. And I think right now that what we want to do with just the Green New Deal is just necessary. You know, that's what we have to do for it's it's survivalist, if you will. It's like the bare minimum to eke it out for yeah. our children. For the children. next step. Yeah. yeah. Yep. We want to get to X. We yes. We want to have X. Yes, yes. And there's no reason to define it because in 500 years, they're going to laugh at our petty arguments over, you know, theory, because they're going to have their own material conditions that will mean that we're just historical. So we don't need to get hung up on the details of X. Uh, just fight the good fight for essentially for people over profit for uh, I mean, all these slogans are good ones uh, for for the commons over enclosure. Um and really for justice over injustice. I mean, that's kind of basic since America. I mean, it's been so stripped bare, the systemic racism in American history and in the current situation, the George Floyd murder, the Black Lives Matter uh, um, demonstrations of last this last summer. Um, these were important. I think that they were a huge moments in American history where maybe we're going to finally take the next step out of the Civil War. Uh, I mean, I think big things are changing because of your generation saying, look, we're not going to take it anymore. And you know what? When I was a kid, um, we stopped the Vietnam War. It was ugly, but it was a stupid imperialist war. 
and we were on the line and that we were going to be the people getting killed. That was that was what made us so effective was that the draft meant that your own life was on the line and everybody is deeply radicalized when their life's on the line. So we did that. It was only one step along the way. And obviously, a lot of stuff was left undone. But now you've got your moment for your step. And yeah, it could be good. Yeah, I'm, I'm pumped. Um, let's call it there. Kim Stanley Robinson, thank you for coming on. Um, everyone should for sure get this book because it's, I've read a bunch of these and this one might be one of my favorites. Well, thank you. Um, thank you guys. Much appreciated it. Yeah. We'd love to have you back on sometime. My pleasure. I'm always up for it. Um, it's a, it's a great to uh, have a discussion with fellow leftists of a younger generation. So kick some ass out there. And um, yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming on. You're a personal hero of mine. All right. All right. Play the song. Dreamed I was an Eskimo. 